Let's pray together. Amen, Lord. Amen. Oh, teach us now. Not just the idea that if we suffer with you, we will reign with you, but teach us the mindset, the emotional disposition, the readiness of soul to do that. To suffer readily in love, in service, in hope. Come help me to help me to put now a little more Bible underneath this hope, I pray. Keep me faithful to your word. Make these women expectant and hungry. Give them a discerning spirit to avoid anything that is amiss and a readiness to embrace whatever is true. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a participant, a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, not with compulsion, but eagerly, not for shameful gain, but willingly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that at the right time he might Exalt you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober, be watchful. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the whole world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, confirm, establish, and strengthen you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Woven through the entire letter of 1 Peter is the repeated call, including chapter 5, the repeated call for a condition of heart and a way of life that only makes sense if you are rock solid sure of a reward beyond this life. Peter calls us again and again to think and feel and act in a way that cannot be explained in this world, but can only be explained by an unshakable, all-satisfying hope beyond this world. 
And of course, I don't mean a hope for material wealth or pain-free health or reunion with loved ones or perfect leisure or futility-free productivity in the age to come. You get all those thrown in. Those are not central. They are not primary. That's not the main thing Jesus died for. The ultimate reward that you have to be confident about if you're going to live the life of First Peter is the reward of being with God and enjoying Him in His glory forever. That's the main thing Jesus died for, for you. <coughs> I think 1 Peter 3.18 is one of the most important verses in the Bible. I wrote a whole book about it called God is the Gospel. It goes like this. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. That's why He died that he might bring you to God. Not for punishment in the presence of God, but for pleasure in the presence of God. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He died for those pleasures. He died so that you would be brought without wrath and without condemnation, into the presence of God with everlasting happiness in the glory of God forever. If you don't want that as the main treasure and supreme satisfaction of your life, you don't want heaven. And you don't want, you don't want what Christ died for. But if you do want that, if that is your desire and that is your confidence, not only will you be able to understand 1 Peter, you will be able to live 1 Peter. And that's the only way you will be able to live 1 Peter. Have you ever been bothered like me, I wonder, by 315? 1 Peter 315, it's been mentioned many times. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. When was the last time anybody did that? Why hope? Why would anybody formulate the question like this? I see in your life that you must have a hope that I don't get. Why would they ever ask that? It's because the life of the Christian can only be explained by hope. It can only be explained by hope beyond the grave. Our lives that we're called to live by Peter don't make sense. They are unintelligible in the categories of the world in this closed system called the universe, this life that you're called to live in 1 Peter makes no sense without something beyond called hope. That's why Peter says we should want them to ask that question. Peter is calling us to live in such a way that our lives cannot be explained in the categories of this world. For example, chapter 1, verse 6, we are told to rejoice in suffering. Now, what in the world could make sense of that? It goes like this. 
so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. That's why it makes sense. Without the revelation of Christ and the glory that you will have at that moment, the suffering you're called upon to rejoice in is insane. Paul said we're of all people most to be pitied, not admired. Or another example, chapter 3, verse 5, we're called to do good, wives especially here, do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. <laughs> Are you kidding me? How in the world can you tell these women not to fear anything that is frightening? Answer, verse 5, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. That's your only hope to be a fearless wife, a fearless mother, a fearless woman in this particular world. Fearless because these are the women who don't hope in this world. They hope in God. Example number three, 1 Peter 3, 9. He commands us not to repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, to bless. Bless the people who are mistreating you. What makes sense of that? Tell Donald Trump about that. What makes sense of that? Here's what makes sense of it. Because you were called to this, that you may obtain a blessing. Without that, this makes no sense. The blessing beyond is incomparable. Example number four, chapter four, verse 13. We're called to the counterintuitive behavior of rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. They were horrible. Peter, come on. Get real. How in the world can anyone rejoice in sharing the sufferings of Christ? Answer, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. That's the only thing that makes sense out of this crazy life. So I say it again, woven through this entire letter is Peter's repeated call, think a certain way, feel a certain way, act a certain way that cannot be explained. Cannot be explained without hope beyond the grave at the coming of the Lord Jesus in particular. Now, what is that way of thinking? What is that way of feeling, that way of acting? Here's my sentence to sum up First Peter's call. A joyful humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. Say it again. A joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. He really does call us to that. A few examples. Chapter 2, verse 20. What credit is it if when you sin you are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good, and suffer for it, you endure. That's a gracious thing with God. Crazy. Unintelligible to the world. Chapter 3, verse 14. Even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Chapter 3, verse 17. It is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will. Chapter 4, verse 1. Christ suffered. Arm yourself with the same mind. Chapter 4, verse 19. Let those who suffer according to God's uh, will and trust their souls to a faithful creator. This is a strange way of life. First century, 21st century, and every other century, this is a strange way of life. A joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. Another name for it is called love. So when we come now to chapter 5, we should not be surprised 
that the two threads weaving this chapter together are a mindset to serve and suffer and an otherworldly hope sustaining it over and over and over again. So let's do a quick survey of chapter 5, then we'll come back and, and look at a few details. In verse 1, Peter presents himself not as an apostle, which he did in chapter 1, verse 1, but as a fellow elder. This is the front-ranking apostle, at least among Jewish people, along with Paul among Gentile people. This is, this is mega authority in the early church, and he is coming down, getting his arms around the elders of the churches, and saying, I'm one of you. He's modeling what he's going to call for in verses 2 and 3. And he's doing so because he says, I was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Painfully so was he a witness. And I'm a partaker in the glory that's coming. You hear that? I've, I saw it. I'm testifying to it, and I'm going into glory where he went, over all rule and authority and power. And so for now, I'm real content to come down with you men, you elders, and, and get my arms around you and say, I'm one, of, I'm one of you. I'm exhorting not as a big shot right now. I'm, I'm exhorting as a, a fellow elder. And so he tells them, verse 2, not under compulsion, I don't want to twist your arm. I, I, I do not want that kind of obedience in the church. I don't want that kind of leadership in the church. Don't be a person who acts out of necessity and compulsion, but rather willingly. Verse 2, second half of the verse. Not for shameful gain. Oh, God deliver us from women and men who work in the church for money, who are driven by shameful gain, but rather eagerly. Verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. That's beautiful. What in the world makes sense of that kind of leadership? In a world then and now where coercion and money and power are the essence of leadership. It's where you get it done. You coerce people. You pay people. You entice people with power and rank. That's the way you get it done. And how, how are you going to get it? How are you going to lead as an example in a completely opposite way? Answer, verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You don't need it now. Lay it down. Get out on the floor and play in the nursery. Get your men to work in the nursery. Be a good model, pastor. Work with the kids, work in evangelism, work in cleaning the church. Do the stuff. Be an example. You're going to get glory more than you can imagine someday. So don't lord it over people now. Don't work for money now. Don't be under compulsion now. That kind of sacrificial, joyful, humble leadership makes no sense in this world unless there's an unfading crown of glory on the way. True biblical eldership only makes sense in the light of eternity. If it is explainable, and I know I'm talking to men mainly right now, but, 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 a lot of you are married to them, and you are all 99% of you anyway, parts of churches where you have enormous influence and enormous responsibility that your leaders lead like this. 
informs your prayers, informs how you call the next pastor, it informs how you encourage me, it informs a hundred things that you do. If the elders' leadership can be explained in natural terms, it's defective. Let's turn to verses 5 to 7. The same mindset that Peter was just calling the elders to, he now calls everybody to, especially the younger. And you see it in the word likewise. Isn't that a remarkable word there at the beginning of verse 5? Because he's just been speaking to leaders. Likewise, that is, just as the elders are called to be humble and serve as examples, so you who are younger... Be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves. And now he says, all of you, all of us in the church, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. <laughs> clothe yourselves, all of you. I wonder why the image of clothing is used. He just said something about why, uh, women and how they were to dress. I don't know if that has anything to do with this, but the best I can guess is that that he's saying if there's going to be dressing up, if there's going to be wearing something that makes you stand out, let it be humility. You want a uniform in this church? Let's have a uniform, okay? Let's all wear the same thing on Sunday. Let's call it humility. Something like that, maybe. Maybe. Instead of thinking, man or woman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress and walk and be. I don't want to stand out. Stand out. How in the world does, does that kind of lowliness and humility and servanthood get explained in a world where you can't get nominated politically that way? You can't get a job that way. Self-promotion, self-assertion, self-exaltation, that's the, the fabric that I'm going to wear when I do an interview or go on television or have a debate or go in for a job interview. I am pushing me. This doesn't make sense except for the last part of verse 5 and verse 6. God opposes the proud. And the last thing in the universe you want is for the God of all creation to be against you. You want to be against you? Be proud. But he gives grace to the humble. What grace? Don't we have grace? It's the meaning of a Christian, right? We have grace. We live in grace. We stand in grace. What do you mean? He gives grace to the humble. Well, there's more grace. There is a future grace, and he defines it in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. It's coming. This is why such a strange, humble, self-effacing, countercultural attitude makes sense. It makes sense because just over the horizon, all the lowly nobodies, all the lowly nobodies who suffer in obedience of humble contentment in Jesus are going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. You feel like a lowly nobody in your ministry, maybe? John Piper, he'd stand up there in front of 7,000 people. Everybody knows his name. That must be cool. Shine like the sun. All the... The day is coming when there's going to be a great reversal. 
The first are going to be last. The last are going to be first. And the stars of the universe are going to shine with the names of the nobodies of the kingdom. That is very clear in the Bible. Matthew 13, 43, you will shine like the sun in the kingdom of your Father. There are hundreds of thousands, think of it, there are hundreds of thousands of faithful Christians around the world, men and women, in very difficult circumstances right now. Only a handful of people know they exist. They are joyfully and enduring joyfully enduring hardships in following Christ. And it's only a matter of time. And chapter 5 says, a very little time, short time, after you've suffered a little while, meaning a lifetime, a little two-second vapor's breath of life, there is coming a reversal, and all the followers of Jesus will be exalted higher than any human exaltation could possibly imagine. We don't need it now. This is, the, this is the evil of the prosperity gospel. It's a matter of timing. They think they need it now. They think they have to have the material possessions now, the exaltation now. Everything has to go well now. It doesn't. It's not designed to be that way. So to the elders... They don't need coercion to serve gladly. They don't need money to minister willingly. They don't need power to gain a sense of significance, not if they're following Peter. We have set our hope not on the exaltation of the world, but on the exaltation and the glory of God and us in Him in the next world. And there's no comparison. I mean, Donald Trump has a jet plated with gold. It will be a most silly little plastic toy compared to what you fly in in the age to come. It's just, he, he and, and the millions like him are insane. They don't get it. They, 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 they think that this world is reality. It's ultimate reality. It's not ultimate reality. It's a speck. It lasts this long, and eternity is forever, and in eternity, he will exalt you, it says in verse 6. Let's jump now to verses 8 to 10. Peter tells us to deal with the roaring lion, the devil, who wants to devour us. So let's read that. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are, are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Strike you as odd that the devil is not a snake here, slithering to sneak up behind you, get your heel like that, just quick, get you off. He's roaring. Like, Rawr! I'm here. Like, okay, if you're here, I'm running. I'm going to go away. <laughs> Is that smart? Are, are lions stupid? They are stupid. At least the devil is. I don't know about lions, but the devil is stupid. He wouldn't have crucified Jesus if he knew what he was doing. It was suicide. Why is he roaring? Why is, the, why is the devil roaring? I'll tell you why he's roaring. His aim here is not to sneak up on you. It's to terrify you. The devil's aim in this paragraph is to strike terror into the hearts of women and men. He roars when he's hungry and angry. It's true. And he's hungry and you're meal. And he's angry. 
And he wants to terrify you, make you afraid, fill you with anxieties, keep you off balance and nervous. Just the opposite of the daughters of Sarah in chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, where they are to do good and not fear anything that is frightening, including that pussycat. <laughs> kind of woman I want you to be. But many of you are, are fearful women, anxious women, nervous women, about a zillion things in your life. And I, I hope that you go home gloriously confident in your hope. I hope that the Lord's just lifting burdens all over this room, just burdens of anxiety about a thousand things in your life. Because Satan's design is to roar, roar from Orlando, roar from Syria, roaring with horrible things in the world to make people terrified and fearful. We know that the roar is the roar of suffering. Verse 9, second half of the verse, knowing that the same kinds of suffering, that's a reference back to the lion and his roaring, resist the devil, and he will flee free from you, James. Resist the devil, confident in your faith, knowing something, namely that the same kinds of Suffering, so the roar is suffering. The sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So this roaring, biting, clawing lion is causing people to suffer. That's what the, the teeth are. That's what the claws are. That's what the roar is. It's, it's suffering. Suffering in, in which you stand or suffering that's just about to come to you to fill you with fear. That's the lion's Roar, and verse 9 says, resist him, resist him, firm in your faith. Now, does that mean that if you are successful, the claws never cut? If you are successful, the, the teeth never sink? No, it doesn't mean that. It means... When the claws cut and the teeth sink in, you don't stop believing. You don't stop being humble. You don't stop returning good for evil. You don't stop rejoicing. You don't stop loving. That's success. When the lion is roaring and clawing and, and biting with his manifold means of suffering. So success of resistance is not hating and not doubting God, but loving and blessing, even if it costs you your life, to which we respond, are you kidding me? Really? When the adversaries that we face are the agents of the devil, we're supposed to go on returning good for evil? Keep on blessing those who curse? Keep on doing good for them? What's going to make sense out of that? Where are you going to get the strength to do that. Answer verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. I wrote a note to myself this morning while I was having my devotions. I said, um, Lord, 
everywhere that there's glory in a word in the Bible, help me to feel the glory. Everywhere there's value in a word in the scripture, help me to value the value. And these words, who has called you to his eternal glory, eternal glory, not eternal shame, not eternal hiddenness, eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So resist the lion by unwavering joy, humility, and love. Keep on doing good to those who hate you. How? By believing verse 10. Feeling verse 10. Experiencing the miracle of knowing verse 10 is the most real thing in your life. The sufferings are all temporary. Very, very temporary. Even if they're 80 years long. Very temporary. And eternal glory what word would you replace with eternal? I don't know another one that's longer. <laughs> Keep on hoping in this eternal glory. The promise of total restoration, total confirmation, total strength, everlasting, unshakable glory, a future beyond the sufferings of this world, that is the key. So let me go back and, and summarize it. To the elders... Don't lord it over your people. Don't use them for money. Don't begrudge their needs. Serve them eagerly, willingly, joyfully, humbly. How? Verse 4, with rock-solid hope that when the chief shepherd appears, you will be crowned with glory. Number 2, verses 5 to 7, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Humble yourselves. Go low under God. Go low with each other. Be servants. How? In the rock-solid hope, verse 6, end of the verse, at the proper time, you're going to be exalted beyond anything you can imagine. Number three, verses eight to 10, resist the roaring lion who's clawing at you. Resist him with unwavering joy and uninterrupted good deeds towards those who are hurting you. How in the world? Because of verse 10, after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to eternal glory will make it all up. Everything good you ever lost, he will restore forever. So I say it again, which I said at the beginning, woven through the entire letter of 1 Peter, and now we've seen, including in chapter 5, is a call for a kind of life and a kind of heart that only makes sense in view of rock-solid hope in a reward beyond the grave. And the, rock, the, the life is a joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. And the hope here is a crown of glory and the presence of the all-satisfying God having restored everything to us. All wrongs against you will be set right. If they don't get set right here, don't think God has dropped the ball. All patience under mockery will be vindicated. All shame in this world will be replaced with honor. All pain will be removed. All losses will be restored. All brokenness will be mended. All humiliation will be exchanged for garments of glory. All slander will be revealed to be false. You feel like you're living under people in the church spreading lies about you and you have no way to vindicate yourself. That will be fixed and they will be brought down or in Christ cleansed. All slander will be revealed to be false before the whole world all anonymity in the quiet faithfulness 
will be replaced with global fame among millions of redeemed people. Just a matter of time, and the time is short. I have two questions in 20 minutes. If you thought it was over, Two questions that are burning for me, having said what I just said. Number one, how can it be loving? How can it not be selfish to be motivated to bless my enemy by the desire for my own glory in heaven? My own vindication my own pleasure at God's right hand. I mean, a lot of famous ethical teachers in the world argue that if you do anything morally for reward, you've just ruined the morality of the deed. And I've just spent, what, 40 minutes, therefore trying to persuade you to sin. Namely, I'm, I'm telling you that on God's authority, you should be motivated to lay down your lives for others in the hope and confidence that's going to bring you to glory. And without that hope, you can't live that way. That's what I'm arguing. So I'm totally against that viewpoint. And my question is, why, why is it not selfish and why is it not unloving for me to serve you for my benefit? That's question number one. Here's question number two. Is the devil really in charge of suffering? Okay, let's take those one at a time. Number one, is it loving? Why is it not selfish to be motivated the way First Peter, I'm arguing, motivates us over and over again, namely to count on our own. In due time, he will exalt you. <laughs> you think Peter threw that out for nothing? I have five reasons why it's not selfish and unloving, and they get increasingly decisive. So that all I need is number five. <laughs> but, but I think it's good to have all five. So here we go. I, I mean, this, this is a kind of a apology for my life. You don't need to know why I said that. But some of you will know. Um, why is it not selfish? for us to be motivated that way. Number one, in the age to come, we will not exalt ourselves. We will leave it totally in the hands of God, whether he will be pleased to give us that reward of exaltation and glory or not. That's number one. We don't exalt ourselves. It is not a matter of self-exaltation. Number two, when the reward comes, beyond the grave, at the coming of Christ in particular, it will all be of grace. No merit, no earning. 1 Peter 5, verse 5, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Namely, you will be exalted in due time. It will be grace when you're exalted. You won't be able to brag. Number three, the exaltation and the glory that we want, we want, I mean, he didn't tell the elders when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory for them to say, I don't want one. I think he would have smacked them up the side of the head if they had said, I don't want God's reward of a crown. I just think that would have, mm. and I'll, it'll be plain why in just a minute. But number three is, 
The exaltation and the glory that we want is not exaltation over anyone in the kingdom. We're not doing James and John here. Mark 10, right? Can I sit at your right hand and can we sit at your left hand? And those other 10, well, they can sit anywhere they want. But we want right and left. And Jesus did not like that. So this is different. When I think about you in the kingdom, I would be very happy to be lower. Very happy. If he just said, well done, you were faithful in a few sermons, well done. But to you, the faithfulness that you performed with nobody knowing the hundreds of faithful acts, when you rise and get a reward like that, everything in my sanctified soul is going to love you for it. Celebrate that. So this is not about exaltation over anybody. Number four. Okay, the last two, four and five, these are really important. The others were important, but these are really important. Number four. There is nothing morally inferior or defective about wanting reward provided the reward is more of Christ as the supreme joy of our souls. It's not golf. <laughs> Look at my friend David down here because he expects me to say this. It's not everlasting productive activity. It's not having the ideal vacation forever. Like I said, those things are kind of thrown in. Golf is thrown in. Or whatever you like to do. That's not sinful. <laughs> but what makes this desire, this longing, this aching, this confidence, this rock solid hope, a proper and right and beautiful motive is I want more of Jesus. There's more to know of him, more to enjoy of him through this path of life than that path of life. That's number four. And the reason is because God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. When, when, you, when you ache and long to live in a way that maximizes your joy in God, God gets more glory because the more satisfied you are in God, the more glorious he looks in your life. Now here's the last one, and this is the most important. This is the one that you can sit down at, at Panera Bread with and... Uh, and tell that friend of yours who's really stumbling over all the, 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 the seeming selfishness of the New Testament in these kind of motives, this one will work. This one will make sense to her, I think. It is loving to sacrifice for others. It is loving to sacrifice in the hope of reward if our aim in the sacrifice is to win others to come with us into the reward. And I get that from 1 Peter 2.12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now these good deeds are being done to people who are hurting you. It's all over First Peter, right? People are maligning you. Some masters are beating the servants and others are slandering you and, and you're doing good to them. Why? In the hope and the prayer that God would open the eyes of their heart to see that your satisfaction in God is so deep, so unshakable, that you have the resources to keep giving and giving even when they're hurting you in the hope that they will see and believe and join you in that satisfaction. That's the goal. So it's, it's never, I mean, you, you can explain this to somebody. You can say to them, well, look, I am here at this table loving you in the hope that my reward will be greater in heaven. 
and that I will know more of Jesus, love more of Jesus, experience more of Jesus. And that's not selfish and manipulative because you know why I'm here? My joy gets bigger if you join me. I really want you to join me. I really want you to go with me. There's not enough evangelism like that, ladies. There's not enough. We, we've got, we don't plead enough. We don't look right into her eyes and say, I want you to go. I want you with me. To say right into a Muslim's eyes, I want you with me. To say of a person who's got another sexual orientation, I want you to be with me in heaven. That's why I'm here, because a shared joy is a double joy. My joy will be bigger if your joy in God is part of my joy in God. That's not manipulative. That's not unloving. That's not selfish. That's love. It's the only kind of love that can be if, in fact, God is all-satisfying and promises to be increasingly satisfying as we serve him in the way First Peter calls us. So that's my answer to question number one. No, it is not unloving. No, it is not selfish. It is, in fact, exactly what love does. It seeks to know and enjoy more of God through the path of suffering in the hopes that others will see our satisfaction and join us in it and thus increase ours and theirs. Final question. Is the devil in charge of suffering? Is the lion in charge? He's roaring, he's clawing, he's biting. What about God? What, what's he doing when the devil roars? It's true. Chapter 5, verse 9. Resist the devil, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering. So you see the connection there? The devil is causing this suffering. Resist the devil, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So it's happening all over the world. And it's happening because Satan hates Christians. And he means to roar and frighten them and devour them if he can. So it's plain to me that Satan has a mighty big hand in the horrors of this world. Jesus said that much in Revelation 2.10. He's speaking to the church in Smyrna through John. And he says this, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Pause. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison. He can do that. He does that. In order that you may be tested Hmm, hmm, who's test? And you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So Satan can throw you in prison and keep you there till you die. And it's a test to see if you will be faithful and receive the crown. God's test. Peter would add, verse 10, chapter 5, as you go to jail, he's whispering in your ear, after you have suffered a little while, the God who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will restore, confirm, strengthen, Establish. We haven't lingered over those four words. We just got back from Italy and visited the Colosseum. Christians were torn to shreds there. So my, maybe these four words are trying to address every kind of death you ever die. Have you ever watched people die? It's never pretty. And if they're very old, it can be so sad. There's just a skeleton left. 
And it's just so inglorious, sown in dishonor, raised in honor. And I, I think Peter's just trying to help, help Christians if somebody says, yeah, but what if, what if we have, what if it's the lions? What if it's real lions? And what are they going to do to us? Will, there won't be anything left to bury. And I mean, just the horrors of, of facing some kinds of suffering would make those four words restore, confirm, strengthen, establish, be so helpful in that moment. And so Peter is saying to those who may have to go to jail and die, believe. Now that's not the whole story because I'm just, so far I'm just talking about the devil being in charge of suffering and God giving us wonderful promises to bring us through. And a lot of people just leave it there. They just leave it there. Well, that's not where the Bible leads it. Satan is not the ultimate authority in this world. He's not the ultimate authority over suffering. We know it from Job, right? Satan had to go to God to get permission to afflict Job. That's paradigm shaping. He had to go to God to get permission to afflict Job. And the and, uh, first thing God says is, okay, go ahead. He lets us fall into these awful claws Go ahead, just, just don't touch him. And so his kids are killed. All ten of them. And Satan comes back because Job says, The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, my. Do we know what we're singing? Blessed be. And I look around when people are singing that. I say, are you kidding me? Do you know what you're saying? Matt Redmond knows. Do you know? It's true. First time I ever heard that song was right after a little baby was stillborn in Turkey to a missionary family of ours. I cried in that song, my hands out like this. He gives and takes away gives and takes away my heart will choose to say blessed be your name that's what job did and so satan goes back to god and says uh let me have his skin and god says you can have his skin just not his life and he afflicts him with the most horrible boils worms got in the boils he scraped them with a pot broken. Have you ever had kind of sword that looked like the worms out of the boils? His wife, no offense, ladies, was not a lot of help. <laughs> so you want to you be a helpful wife at this point. Don't, don't say curse God and die. <laughs> he, he, but I think Job was patient with her. I'm going to give him the best... He said, you, you talk like, like one of the foolish women. <laughs> like. <laughs> Isn't that good? Like, you're not. You're not one of them. I'm not, I'm not giving you up. You talk, but you're talking like one. <laughs> Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive evil? And the inspired writer says, thus he did not sin with his lips. So we know from Job that Satan doesn't have the last word and he, he doesn't have the upper hand. And he has to get permission. And we know that Peter agrees with him because of chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls. Or chapter 3, verse 17. It is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will. Or chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It is in this hope you rejoice, though now for a little while you have, if necessary, you have been grieved. N necessary for what? So that your faith would be refined and turn out like gold. Praise and glory and honor at the coming. So yes, Satan is a roaring lion and Satan causes suffering, but he doesn't have 
ultimate authority in this world. And I think his roaring is the louder because he knows he cannot act on his own without accomplishing God's purposes. I mean, have you ever thought, putting together chapter 5 and chapter 1, roaring, lying, and suffering being caused. In chapter 1, if necessary, you must suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable, is tested by fire, might redound unto praise and glory and honor. You ever put those together and see how angry that must make Satan? All he can do is sanctify Christians. That's, that's all he can do. If you resist him, firm in your faith, if you turn on God and say, I've had enough of you. If you treat your children like this, I'm out of here. If you do that, it won't result in sanctification and you will join Satan in the lake of fire and you will have given him his day and you don't want to do that. So we need to close. I'm 35 seconds over. I'm not sending you home with a formula for when to accept being slandered and when you confront it. I'm not sending you home with a formula for when to turn the other cheek. I'm not sending you home with a formula for when to endure mistreatment as a believer and when to rebuke and admonish. Or when to spank your child and when to be more lenient. Or when to confront your husband about a shortcoming or when to forbear. Or when to endure discrimination at work against yourself or plead for justice. Or move to a dangerous place for Christ. Or move away because of the danger. I don't have a formula. What I send you home with is Peter's call to think and feel and act in a way that only makes sense if you have a great reward in heaven that satisfies your soul. I, I send you home with a, a passion to be so controlled by the Holy Spirit that you will live in a way that somebody finally will ask a reason for the hope that is in you because they can't explain your joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve and love rather than return evil for evil. You're going to have a crown of glory. You're going to be exalted at the right time. And after you've suffered a little while, the God who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself restore, confirm, establish, and strengthen you, and he will do it, and you know he will do it, because verse 7 says something we passed over, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And verse 11, to him belongs dominion, total care and complete dominion. That's what you go home with. Total care and complete dominion calling you to live a life that cannot be explained without confidence in eternal glory. Let's pray. So, Father, I long for that. I, I want that. I know I do not live up to that way of life or hold fast to that hope as consistently as I should. And I suspect that none of these women do either. And therefore, we need the true grace of God. We need to stand in it. Grant your help. Oh, that they might go home filled with joy, inexpressible, filled with glory in hope. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.